Welcome. In this lecture, we're going to take a look at domestic violence when we have male victims. Um, and specifically, we're going to be examining the research looking into cases where we have male victims at the hands of female perpetrators. We will look further into same sex, transgender, etc. situations in a future lecture. So in this lecture, to give you an idea of what we're going to be looking at, we're going to talk briefly about the history of research in this area. Um, also raise um, uh, interesting point about conflicting opinions about uh, male victimization in domestic violence situations. We're going to take a closer look into what are some of the characteristics of female perpetrators. And then we're going to go into looking at what are the characteristics of the actual victims themselves. Um, are there resources out there to help men? Um, what are some of the characteristics that they, that they tend to share? as well as what are some of the similarities in the experiences we see among uh, male victims. Now you'll notice on this particular lecture that I don't have any associated readings. And part of that will come to light as we go further into the lecture. And that's because even in 2020, we still, are, we still need more research in this area. Um, and in fact, the course textbook we has, ha if you were to look to the index at the back of your uh, course textbook and look up male or men and then victims, there's probably about five, six pages in the entire thick textbook that are really um, specifically attribute, attributed to investigating domestic violence with male victims. Um, that kind of just gives you a glimpse into the lack of research that's out there. Um, we, there's not even an entire chapter that's, you know, sort of focused specifically on male victimization. So let's go ahead and take a look at what the research does tell us about male victimization in domestic violence situations. As we have discussed in prior lectures, um, systematic research into domestic violence or intimate partner violence really began with the domestic violence revolution of the 1970s. Um, and what we have found when we look at from the 1970s up until now, and we try to sort of identify the victimization, what's the differences or similarity when we look at uh, reports of domestic violence, here's what we see. Data from sources such as crime and hospital reports appear to show that women are the primary victims. But as we have started to see an expansion of sort of like community-based or population-based surveys, what we're starting to find is that women aren't necessarily the primary victims. Actually, they may be perpetrators just as much as men are. Um, so it depends. And we talked about this in previous lectures. When we look at whether it's a, the um, National Crime Victimization Survey or other sort of community-based surveys that is as sources of data collection, we have seen sort of a shift in the demographics of victims um, of domestic violence. Um, and so maybe this tells us a little bit about the willingness to report or certain stigmas that surround victimization, um, especially amongst male victims. So we notice that crime and hospital reports uh, paint a picture as if women are the primary victims. But when we get people to respond to surveys in sort of an anonymous or confidential manner, we're starting to realize that maybe that's not the case, that maybe it is the victimization rates are roughly similar across um, the, the genders. And then also critics of the, the latter studies, those community-based studies, um, often will respond with the, the comment that violence by women, when the women are the actual perpetrators, was actually in self-defense or retaliation. So almost saying that they were the initial victim, but yet it was their acts of violence toward a male victim were done in self-defense or retaliation, which once again diminishes the credibility of the male victim. So that has created 
two conflicting opinions about male victimization when it comes to domestic violence. On one side, we have researchers who would argue that violence is a human problem, not a gender problem. And violence by women should not be ignored because most of it is not enacted in self-defense. That's one side of the argument. On the other side of the argument, we have individuals who would argue that focusing on the acts in general, the acts of violence by women towards men, ignores the uh, initial motivations, precipitating events, as well as the interpersonal and historical context of the violence, sort of the patriarchal society um, that we exist in. And then, therefore, they would argue that one must first understand that the power structure of society is one in which males are socially, politically, and economically dominant over females. So one of the toughest things that we notice about studying male victimization of, in domestic violence situations is trying to pick which side of these um, you know, sort of competing opinions, which side do you fall on? Do you see that that violence is a human problem in general, and, and then we should separate it from sort of our historical past of living in a predominantly patriarchal society where men had higher power, had more control in social, political situations. Which side are you going to fall on? And I'd be the first to argue that, yes, there's definitely, you know, historical context of violence, but that should not diminish our focus on trying to understand and help um, the reality of the lives and the situations that male victims are facing. I um, mean, a victim is a victim regardless of the historical context. And as advocates to fight against domestic violence, I hope all of us are looking for ways to recognize um, when domestic violence is actually occurring, who the actual victim is, and how to assist that particular person. So thus, when we look at these two conflicting opinions, most of the prevailing framework within the research um, and within sort of the general discussion about domestic violence concludes that males are more often than not the perpetrators and the females are actually the victims. And also, the prevailing framework is that violence by men against women is a more serious problem because it can result in more injuries. So with these in our, you know, sort of now that we have an idea of where we, we stand um, in a societal fashion, looking at domestic violence, I think this will shine a little bit of a light on what we're going to see in the upcoming slides when we look at the resources available to men, or rather, I should say the lack of resources that are available for male victims of domestic violence. So let's start this sort of investigation into the research by looking at well, what are some of the major or predominant characteristics of female perpetrators. First, let's look at the, the motive for violence. Um, research has shown that things such as anger, jealousy, retaliation for emotional hurt, efforts to gain control, dominance, um, are the types of things that are the motive for the violence. Now, does that sound like it'd be much different than it might be for a male perpetrator um, acting out against a female victim? Probably not, right? Anger, jealousy, retaliation, efforts to gain control. A lot of those sound very similar to what we have seen in the, in the literature when we have that male perpetrator. Number two, research has shown that half of all violent arguments are initiated by women. Once again, it's a pretty balanced field. Um, arguments that result in violence are more often than not a balanced starting point, right? You know, half the time it's the man, half the time it's, it's the woman. And we've seen this replicated in research, not just recently, but going back, as you can see in number two here, Strauss and Gels going back to 1988. So this is not a new finding. Um, when we look at point number three on this slide, 50% of violent relationships, the violence is mutual. Once again, nothing 
um, too surprising. Approximately 25% of violence is perpetrated only by the male and approximately 25% of violence is perpetrated only by the female. So what we're seeing right here is that a lot of the motives and a lot of the initiation of violence look very similar to what we have seen with sort of the classic stereotypical um, depiction of domestic violence with a male perpetrator and a female victim. And so when we flip the coin and see a male victim and a female perpetrator, we're seeing a lot of the rationales and sort of the starting points are very similar. And the research is showing us that. And then one other thing uh, in number four is we also see that is despite arguments to the contrary, um, research would argue that men do not necessarily have more power than women within the family unit. And that's an important thing. So despite the fact that there is a historical, um, uh, I don't know, precedent of male dominance, socially, politically, et cetera, um, within within America, within the family unit, especially over the last couple decades, we're noticing that more and more women oftentimes have just as much power as, as the male. Um, and so when we look at this, we're starting to see that then, well, why don't we have more of a focus on research or more research on male victimization? And a lot of this, as we're going to see in the coming slides, comes to sort of like, you know, culturally held stereotypes, uh, stigmatization, things of that nature. So we don't really know as much as we would like about male victims of domestic violence. Um, as I alluded to before, they have rarely been systematically studied. So if you're going, what the heck does he mean by systematically studied? All I'm saying is we don't have piles and piles of research studies that have focused exclusively on male victims. Um, if we had to put, you know, stack up all the research that has gone into to domestic violence, the, the biggest stack of research is going to be the situations where we have heterosexual relationships with a female victim. And so when we start to think about same sex, transgender, or in this particular um, lecture, male victimization by a, a female perpetrator, there's just not that much uh, research out there. Um, and also because of this and because of sort of culturally held beliefs about men being physically, emotionally stronger than females, which I'm hoping most of us listening to this would, you know, maybe the physical part, sure. But emotionally, psychologically, you know, the male strength is, is a misnomer and we need to recognize that people are people. Um, and we need to understand that and, and sympathize with that, empathize with that. Um, when we think about it, but because of some of these sort of culturally held stereotypes, there have been very few grassroots efforts uh, to, to help male victims. And going along with that, we see in point three here, there's been nothing as well organized or widespread as that shelter movement that we've seen for women. You know, going back to the 1970s, we see a push for uh, women's shelters and things of that nature. For men, we just have not seen that same sort of organization and offers or efforts to help these individuals. Um, and then there's also a competing contingent of, of researchers looking at number four here that argue that such, you know, the, the idea of a male victim, they just don't exist is the argument that male victims aren't really victims. They are wolves in disguise, so to speak, right? They were the ones who actually initiated the violence in the first place. Those men were the ones who were inflicting uh, forms of coercive control upon their female counterpart. And the, the female's reaction was one of self-defense or retaliation. So the men in and of themselves are really not true victims. They are perpetrators in disguise. And then finally, um, there are other people who argue that even though, yes, they may say there are men who are victimized, but the extent that they're victimized really isn't a big deal. It's not a significant social problem, things of that nature. So 
a lot of these things are sort of sort of embedded in structure or culturally held beliefs and stereotypes about the male female relationship in general and all of this has helped to sort of fog the picture and through that that foggy lens we have not reached out to really understand or provide efforts to help male victims of domestic violence And perhaps because of these culturally held stereotypes, uh, these ideas of stigmatization, um, our inability to sort of see the world breaking away from historically patriarchal lenses, we find this, what we see on this slide, that male victims don't seek help nearly as much as women. Why? Well, we have four things here that are all in the source coming from the hotline.org, um, provides some information and resources um, to back this up. So one, men are not socialized or men are socialized not to express their feelings or see themselves as victims, right? The old, you know, Western movies with the, you know, the tough cowboy or whoever it was, or, you know, Bruce Willis in Die Hard as being sort of the tough guy or, Whatever type of, you know, we think about movies, men are supposed to be the, the strong, silent type as opposed to being willing to express their feelings and admit that they're a victim. Um, and along with that, we have number two, that there's pervading beliefs or stereotypes about men being abusers and when women being the victims. So even when men are willing to express their feelings, oftentimes the sort of social response is to mock them, laugh at them and say, no, you're, there's probably a reason that she responded and, and came at you because you were probably the abuser in the first place. Um, number three, um, the abuse of men is often treated as less serious or, you know, a joke something that would be a mockery, like, oh, you know, oh, you got hit by a girl, oh, poor thing, type of responses. Um, and you can imagine all of these things as they're starting to build up really explains why men may be less likely to seek help. And then finally, number four, many believe that there are no resources or support um, available for male victims. And in fact, I'm gonna show you a couple um, examples of number four in the upcoming slides. But before we get to that, let's take a look at this. Why don't men seek help? We see it. The way they are socialized is, you know, don't complain about being a victim. Um, they already feel that they're going to be blamed for being an abuser, even if they really are the victim. Um, the fact that there's a sense that, oh, you can't be hurt by a girl. Well, I think most of us would agree, it doesn't matter if you're hit by a man, a woman, some uh, anything else. Um, if you're hit by a child, being hit, being hurt, hurts, right? I mean, it doesn't, you know, we all hurt. That's part of life. Um, and it's not just the physical violence or the physical pain. Oftentimes, it's the emotional pain. And as humans, we have feelings, whether male, whether female, we have feelings. All right, so let's dive a little bit deeper into the resources or lack thereof available for men. From the previous slide, one of the biggest takeaways, and I think this is going to sort of lead us as we continue on through this lecture, is this statement. There has been no one place where abused men gather. And we're going to notice this is one of the toughest things. Even in the world we live in today, where we have women's shelters, you don't hear a whole lot about men's shelters, right? Um, but we also have a social media-driven world, an internet-based world where you think you'd be able to find a lot of resources. And I encourage you, go do a Google search for support services for male victims of domestic violence and see not how many sort of valid and reputable websites you find or resources you find, but rather pay attention to how few you actually find. And that's one of the things we're going to see as we sort of go through this. But before we get too much more into talking about the resources available to men, let's talk a, look at, a little bit about like the idea of, well, just how many men are actually victims, 
So depending upon the source of the research, we find you know different levels, just like we saw at the beginning of this lecture when we talked about domestic violence victimization in general, depending upon the time period or the form of data collection, we're gonna see differing levels or estimates of domestic violence victimization. So going back to the 1980s with Strauss and Gels, we find, found that 5% of married men reported being victims of severe violence by their wives. Okay. So some people may say, well, that I've heard that for women, it's one out of every four women or one out of every you know, three or every five. And nurse say, might say, well, 5% means one out of every 20 man, men are being victimized. And therefore, it's really not a significant social problem. Well, I'm hoping for all of us listening to this right now that we hope that even if there's one case of victimization, that is important. And we do need to be aware of it. And we need, do need to reset, reach out for um, these particular victims. Now, my guess is that was probably a gross underestimate going back to what we saw in some of the previous slides about the lack of male reporting of their own victimization. When we jump ahead to the 2010 through 2012 NISVS um, uh, survey data, they found that 11% of men are victims of contact sexual violence, physical violence, and or stalking by an intimate partner with negative impacts. So we're starting to see maybe it's not 1 in 20, maybe it's closer to 1 in 10. Then we jump ahead a little bit further to 2015. The same survey source, but just a latter um, round of data or wave of data collection found that 25, so one in four men, are victims of contact sexual violence throughout their lives. So the numbers may be, even for men, may be much more similar to female victimization than we originally thought several decades ago. And then down at the bottom is I have a definition of what contact sexual violence includes. Um, and so what we can see here, and the, the main takeaway from this slide is we still don't have a very good estimate or barometer for the amount of male victimization. So where can we help men? How do we help men? We saw a, two slides ago that one quote that talked about there's no one place where abused men can gather. So where can men go if they really need help? And I'm going to show an example of the Domestic Abuse Helpline for, for Men. Um, DOM is, is sort of the acronym that goes with it. And I find this to be a pretty good illustration of the lack of resources that we still have for male victims. So 1994, President Bill Clinton signed into effect, into effect the Violence Against Women's Act. And as groundbreaking and as wonderful as this act was, one of the great things that came out of it was the National Domestic Violence Hotline. And you can see here that 1-800 number 799-7233 is still active, still available. And it has been a great resource for victims of domestic violence um, over, over the years. But you can see even by the name of that act, Violence Against Women's Act, was already ignoring the record or not even recognizing the sort of plight of male victims, wasn't even recognizing that there were male victims out there. And over the years, if you, uh, the, the National Domestic Vi Violence Hotline, sorry, has reported what, you know, the percentage of who calls, who calls as a victim. And even today, we find that 87% roughly. Um, of the calls are from v female victims and only 13%, give or take, are from male victims. So we still see a disproportionate amount of people seeking help who are, are, are women. Now, is this because more women are being victimized? Going back to some previous slides where we talked about sort of that, you know, the two sides of the coin, which side of this argument are you on? Some people would say we see a much higher amount of female calls simply because there's more women being victimized. The other side of the coin would say, no, it's because 
of a you know cultural stereotypes and stigmatization against men that there are men out there who are being victimized but they're not willing or to call out for help so following the 1994 passage of the VAWA Act we see 2000 so in 2000, the first ever helpline in the United States for male victims of intimate partner violence was created. This was the Domestic Abuse Helpline for Men, otherwise known as DOM. Roughly 10, 11 years later, DOM was expanded to be more inclusive. DOM expanded to become the Domestic Abuse Helpline for Men and Women in 2011. And you see that phone number down at the bottom of the slide. Now, if we were in class right now, and I do not encourage ever, ever calling a helpline number as a prank. No, please do not do that. But the last time we actually had the opportunity to teach this course in person, I took out my cell phone and I called that number on the bottom of the slide, that 888 number. And do you think I got a domestic abuse helpline? No, I did not. I got some other agency that when I even inquired about whether or not they provided resources, the person on the other end of the line spoke to me like I was an idiot. And this may give you an idea of where I'm going. Even though there are or have been attempts to have resources for men, many of them die off. Many of these resources spring up in hopes that they'll help men or men will reach out. And then either through lack of funding, lack of actual you know, efforts by individuals to reach out to them, a lack of politi um, politicians or other um, agencies or groups supporting them, they die off. And we're gonna see that's exactly what happened with DOM. So the Domestic Abuse Helpline for Men, DOM, should and was touted as providing practical assistance in the form of a toll-free crisis line, referral services, and court advocacy support to victims. It sounds exactly like what we would like to see for victims of domestic violence. And they were also touted as an agency that would be used to um, gather data about male victims. So one of the things about DOM was not only were they, you know, a helpline where people could call in, but if people were willing to, you know, confidentially or anonymously volunteer the information they shared, that data could be used to help um, build research about male victimization um, when it comes to, to domestic violence. But the sad reality is that the helpline as well as the website for DOM are now defunct. Defunct meaning they don't exist anymore. And they don't, if you go to either that phone number I talked about on the previous page, the 888, or this website that you see here, noexcuseforabuse.org, it is no longer leads you to the DOM website. We have talked about the DOM website and the fact that it went defunct. And so when I originally found that out, I said, wow, this is really just another illustration of the lack of resources, the lack of focus, lots of social focus, sorry, the lack of social focus on male victimization. And so I thought, well, what's out there? What are the resources for men, especially on a national level? Now, obviously, depending upon what city or state individuals live in, there may be smaller um, uh, city level, county level resources. But by and large, you know, that works if you're living in an area that has resources and funding and large population centers. But if you live in an area that is more, you know, rural, um, you may not have those resources. So I just started doing a Google search, looking to see what was out there for men. Um, one site source that I found was I Googled, or I Googled, you know, domestic violence help for men. And I started going through a few things. And you can do this too, if you're curious to see just sort of, you know, and you could do um, a contrast, um, do help for women, help for men. Um, as our next upcoming lectures we'll talk about, we'll talk about the LGBTQ plus community. Um, 
And I'm always curious to see like, you know, one of the ways to get an idea of where is the pulse of empathy amongst humans, especially here in America, is the doing a Google search. If we care about things, it'll show up in a Google search. Um, and I was surprised by the lack of information I've been able to find just doing that simple sort of exercise um, to find help for male victims. So one of them, I, that one of the sites and organizations I found was Male Survivor. And Male Survivor is, sounds like, and looks like a terrific organization that provides resources to male survivors of sexual trauma, but this is not specific to domestic violence. And in fact, if you, if you Google that and go to their website, you'll notice a lot of their focus is on, you know, childhood sexual abuse and things of that nature, um, which is obviously something that we definitely need, but it's not specifically catered to male victims of domestic violence. Um, we also see Safe Place was another one that I found, which is a Texas-based organization that provides services and shelter for male victims of both sexual assault and domestic violence. Um, but probably the best current source that I could find for men specifically was through helpguide.org. Um, and one and helpguide.org has a lot of different, like, you know, um, I don't know what I'd call it, but websites connected to it, I guess I should say, for different types of individuals who may need help, whether it's financial help, domestic violence help, quite a few other things. But they do have a one of their sites that is specifically focused on help for abused men. I have the resource here or the link here if you want to take a look at it. And that was arguably one of the best ones that I found. Um, Two others that had been touted on other websites and other searches as being very helpful. One was the Center Against Domestic Violence that was based out of New York City to offer information and support for male victims, as well as another one was known as Lambda's Anti-Violence Project to provide support and resources to LGBTQ victims of violence. These are both things that I found referenced on multiple Google searches for trying to help male victims of domestic violence. But sure enough, when I did a deeper search, both of these were defunct or no longer active. So what's the takeaway? What's the message I'm trying to get to share with you over these last couple slides? The main takeaway for that I want you to get there is even now, 2020, the internet age, the social media age that we live in, there still is a lack of resources for male victims. That's it. I've said it multiple times, but that's one thing that I've seen sort of in my own personal experiences sort of uh, played out over and over again. Um, and sadly, it's one of the things that I think is sort of an overlooked or forgotten um, part of our society. We have people out there suffering. Um, I shared with you some videos coming out of Great Britain about the couple Alex and Jordan, and you sort of saw his story. I'm going to share some more with you over the coming week. Um, but oftentimes, one of the toughest things, as in any domestic violence case, is that sense of isolation for the victim. And so it's one thing to feel isolation, but also if there really is no helpline out there, if there really aren't that many resources, then your sense of isolation even grows bigger and is more daunting to overcome as a victim. Let's take a little bit of a change and look at rather the resources. Let's look at what are some of the characteristics of male victims of domestic violence. So what we see here is one might say, well, the victims, you know, going, if we, if we want to think about those old, you know, societal stereotypes of the male being the, you know, the, the stronger one, the stoic one who shouldn't, you know, fall victim. We might think that the type of individuals who are victims of domestic violence may be, you know, uh, weaker, less intelligent. Um, maybe there's an age you know, disparity between them and their female attacker, things that nature, or, you know, that where they are sort of in our stereotypical views may be seen as, as a, as prey, um, as a weak man. But if you look at some of the stuff on this slide, what we notice is a lot of these victims are your everyday guy. 
If you look at the occupations and note all the research here comes from that source, the Heinz, Brown and Dunning listed down at the bottom of this page or at the bottom of this slide. If you look at the occupations, you know, the first thing you see is 18% in this one particular study were individuals who were disabled. Okay. So maybe in our minds we go, okay, they're disabled. So therefore they're at home or they are reliant upon their wife, girlfriend, etc., for care. And therefore they're more likely to be victimized. I can see where that argument might go. But as you continue to read down that list of the occupations of individuals who were documented um, victims of domestic violence, you notice you've got, you know, a lot of your stereotypical, strong, you know, strapping men in a lot of these positions. So it's not something that would necessarily be obvious just to look at somebody. We see that 14% of these victims were in the, in, in, military, fire, or police, right? I mean, in many ways, when you think about masculinity, those are areas of occupations that just, you know, and if you want to fall back on the stereotypical viewpoint, you think that's a manly job, right? Students and teachers, laborers, unemployed. So the occupations, what we start to notice and what I want to get away from or what I would like to share with this idea of occupations is as we see with so many other forms of victimization um, in life or other forms of individuals who need help, whether it's suffering from drug abuse or diseases or whatever, you can't just look at somebody on the surface and know who they are or what they're suffering from. And we see that with this list of occupations. We have people across multiple types of fields of work. We look at the age. Let's move over to the left a little bit. The age range of uh, male victims of domestic violence within this larger study ranged from 19 to 64 with a mean right around 40 years old. So it wasn't just younger men that were being victimized or older men. Um, it was, you know, men across multiple um, spectrums. And then you think, well, was it something about having a partner who was significantly younger or significantly older? As you can see, the partner's age, the, so the perpetrator's age, was a little bit younger than the men, but not by a great amount, right? So the average age of the male victim was 41. The average age of the female perpetrator was 36. Um, and then you look at sort of, you know, how did these men respond to their victimization? Well, over half of them, men, half of them were still in the relationship despite the victimization. Over half of the men had children in the house, right? So once again, we start to see looking at those, what we have here in white, very similar to what we see with, you know, a lot of female victims. So there isn't necessarily, maybe we need to encourage people more and more that let's ignore the sexual orientation. Let's ignore the gender. Let's ignore that when we're trying to understand and really appreciate this phenomenon of domestic violence and trying to help the victims. We see that male, female really doesn't matter as far as ages, their response to what's going on, their reasons for staying, you know, if you have children in the house, things of that nature. When we also think about sort of the experiences of the victim was one of the things, and once again, this is nothing that is all that different in many ways from what we've seen with female victimization, but one of the key things was living in fear of some sort of serious injury. So let's start over here on the far left in blue. The majority of males who are currently in an abusive relationship indicated that they were, fe they were fearful that their female partners would cause a serious injury if she found out that they had called the helpline. So one of the key things that we've seen, and one of the things that I hope to stress with all of you who are listening to this, especially if you want to continue to work to be advocates to help victims, is one of the toughest things is victims live in fear of their story being shared outside of that household or that apartment or that living situation. And also, as when we talked about theoretical stuff, the perpetrators, oftentimes, remember we talked about sort of the rational choice thinking. They want to be able to inflict their harm, do their damage, 
in an environment where they are less likely to be discovered. And so even living in fear of trying to call a helpline cuts across gender lines. Let's move over to the black um, notes that I have here. The most frequently cited experiences that we saw amongst male victims were being slapped or hit, pushed, kicked, grabbed, punched, choked. Once again, doesn't sound much different than what we see when we look at a lot of victimization with women. But what is somewhat unique here with men, and women report stories of where they're physically attacked, but with men, one of the things is that we see coming up more and more in the research is sort of attacks specifically to their male genitalia. Um, so once again, you can almost sort of think, if you're trying to think about theoretically, it's almost sort of a a specific area of physical attacks that men or that, that female perpetrators will target on their male victim, which also not only harms them, but also sort of strips away their masculinity in many ways. So we see here two quotes that were taken out of this research article. One, I was writhing, crying in the corner. I couldn't get up for two hours. She kicked me in the groin at least 12 times. Another one. She held a knife to my balls and threatened to cut them off. So one of the things that we start to see when we look into this research is this specific attack to the male genitalia by female perpetrators. Some other experiences of victims that one share similarities when we uh, with that share similarities between both genders when we look at victims, but also we see some other sort of unique things that for, for um, men. Once we see sort of this idea of extreme violence, right? That is sort of a similar thing that we see regardless of the gender of the victim. So male victims report things such as she has pulled knives on me. Uh, she raped me with a dildo. She broke both of my eardrums. We've seen in some of the, the readings we've had, as well as some of the, the videos I've asked you to watch um, with female victims, they've also experienced extreme violence. So we see that it cuts across gender lines. Um, also, this idea about inability to please the aggressor. Um, there's something about, in both cases, we saw it with the case of Deanne and Robbie in, in, the documentary, in one of the documentaries that I had you watch where the, you know, he, only, he wanted her to falsely admit to being unfaithful in order to please him. And when she wouldn't, that just provoked his rage that much, that much more. And we see a similar story when we look at male victims with these two quotes. She has jumped on my back, clawed and scraped me, and I've gotten the shit beat out of me several times. I can never please her. You know, she spit at me pushed me. And when she couldn't get a reaction, she hit me in the head with the cutting board. I don't want to be hurt anymore. Right? So I couldn't please this person. I couldn't get a reaction. A lot of the same stories that we've seen in that sort of classic, um, version of domestic violence. Finally, we also see one of the things when we look at the experience of victims is that coercive control still plays a role, even for male victims. And this came from, I just cut and pasted these six different statements from the helpguide.org. Um, so versions of, and I think a lot of these speak to coercive control. Right. The fact that, you know, male victims will report, you know, verbal abuse, being belittled, being humiliated um, when the perpetrator is possessive, acting jealous, um, accuses you of being unfaithful. Um, other things, limiting access to certain resources, taking away your car keys, um, trying to control where you go and who you see. Um, also, financial control controlling how you spend your money or, and this is was something that showed up, I think was a little bit more unique to the male victims that I hadn't seen in a lot of the information about female victims. So let's take a look at number four. The second part of number four talks about the perpetrator deliberately defaulting on joint financial obligations. So because they fail to pay a credit card bill or because the, the they fail to pay up on something that they were supposed to because in some cases the the account is in the man's name 
the man is the one that the companies, the creditors, etc., the banks come after. Um, number five, making false allegations about you to your friends, employers, the police, or find other ways to manipulate and isolate you. Very similar to what we've seen in classic cases of domestic violence. And then number six, number six is also one that I think leans similar to the second part of number four. I think number six leans a little bit more heavily towards the male experience. And that is threatening to leave the person and more importantly, prevent that person from seeing your kids if you report the abuse. Now, sadly, this exact same website that is listed at the bottom, if you take a look at it, one of the things that it encourages for male victims is it says, don't retaliate, which is a hard thing to tell to a victim. And they say, don't retaliate because if you do retaliate as a male and the police are called out there, once it gets into the courts and the cops and all that sort of system, because of some of these things we started with today with this lecture, is there still society, societal, I can't even say that. So I'll say socially, socially held stereotypes about the role of a male and a female in a relationship, whereas they assume the man is the, the stronger, the aggressor, etc. And so there's always a sense for a lot of male victims that if you retaliate at all, you will be cast as the abuser rather than being seen as the victim. And if there's one key takeaway, or actually there's going to be a couple key takeaways, but I think that's one of the key takeaways from this lecture. So as we finish up this lecture, let's take a look quickly at a couple of the key takeaways I would like you to consider when we think about male victimization. One is we still need more research about the extent and prevalence of male victimization when it comes to, to domestic violence. Two, we need to consciously work to sort of erode and break down some of these socially held stereotypes about the gender balance within various relationships. And then three, one of the things we wanna make sure that we're thinking about is we want to go into any sort of reports or stories about domestic violence with an open mind and not bringing in any of our sort of pre-held, preconceived notions about this sort of gender dynamic, bringing that into that situation because we want to encourage individuals who are being victimized to speak out. We want them to feel that there are resources out there. And that's sort of the final takeaway. The fourth one is, is pushing to make sure that the resources available to victims of domestic violence aren't just catered to one gender or one sort of you know sexual orientation, but rather that our resources are available for everyone, regardless of their gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. So I'm gonna leave you with that today and I will see you at the next lecture. Take care.